Welcome, everybody. So my name is Thomas Gruber. Um, I'm working at the NHR at FAU Computing Center. Um, I will give a short introduction about what it is. Today, we are talking about Liquid. It's a tool developed at Erlangen since 2009. And I took over the development in 2013. And since then, I'm, I'm working on it and uh, add new features and new hardware and so on. So let's see. So where are we? I mean, this is a mainly national talk. So probably everybody of you knows where Erlangen is uh, or Nuremberg. So the Erlangen uh, University is quite old, developed, um, established 1742, uh, quite big university with around 40,000 students. Um, like many universities, we have a nice central main building. The other buildings are not that nice. Um, and this is the Erlangen Regional Computing Center here on the bottom. So the uh, lower building is the computing center. The skyscraper in the, in the back is the computer science uh, department. Um, but we are currently building a new computing center around the corner um, just for HPC. Who we are, um, so NHR, um, and also the stuff at the university. Um, we are an academic HPC center. We have we operate a few clusters, um, so two main clusters and a few special purpose clusters like GPU clusters or large memory nodes and so on. Um, the numbers of people has changed in the last month, so it's probably not six and three anymore, but more like something like eight and four. Um, in the, in the bottom right, you see some of us um, who work with me together. So top left is Professor Gerhard Wellein, the, the lead of the group, um, and I'm on the bottom right. So if you don't see my uh, camera picture. Um, associated with the HPC Computing Center, there's a research group, um, and there we, we care about performance engineering, performance modeling, um, tool development, that's why I'm here. Um, and we work a lot with sparse and stencil solvers. Um, if you're interested in all the stuff we do, uh, there's the central GitHub repository um, with all the um, projects we have, like Handcraft and Osaka um, for modeling, um, but also like um, sparse benchmarks and so on. Um, what is NHR? Um, most of you probably know it's a coordinated network funded by the federal and the state governments. Um, it's important to strengthen the methodological competence um, through training and education. So that's what we do today. And also that's why we have this talk series. At the moment, there are currently eight NHR centers. They started beginning of the year. Um, and that's the RSE, though, so that's the old center, so old HPC resources. Um, LRZ is um, the, in the highest range, and the NHR at FAU is something like tier two regional centers um, operating for all universities in northern Bavaria, mainly. Um, our focus is uh, atomistic simulations, so molecular dynamics um, from chemistry and life science and so on. Um, and as well, uh, based on the research group stuff, um, the performance modeling, um, mainly on node level. So we don't care that much about distributed computing. Um, for us, it's important to get code fast on a single node um, because bad code always scales over multiple nodes. So we wanna have it fast on a single node and then we can think about scaling it to multiple nodes. Um, that's the main workhorse we have at the moment. It's quite old um, and will be replaced like end of this year um, with a new cluster, also bigger. Um, so the Maggie cluster, which I will always also use for uh, the demo or like I, I will run some, some commands on the shell um, that will be on Maggie. Uh, it's a Broadwell system, um, two, two chips per node, like normal in HPC, um, 10 cores per, per socket, 20 cores per node uh, without SMT. 
64 gigabyte of main memory, uh, deprecated Intel OmniPath network, no local disks, and we were shortly in the top 500 list. Um, so for one um, publication, we were on rank 346, and then we were out in the on the next list. Uh, the price was 2.5 million, and the next cluster will something be around 7 million. So the new HPC uh, in our in our HSPC cluster, um, we are currently waiting for the shipment of the parts. So let's go on. Oh, something is broken with the headline here. Um, let's step directly into liquid. Um, so first some some intro slides about it and then talk about affinity and topology and so on and, and how to get some clock speeds on the nodes um the the idea of liquid is always to support us in our daily work so we run a lot of stuff on local systems on systems which we don't know before um so we have a lot of pre-release machines um and so on um for that we need a detailed node information you can you know all the uh, files and tools you can use for that lscpu and so on hw log if you need more information um, liquid topology is basically a front end to hw log um, and gives you like a like like an output that's the same for all nodes you you are looking at um, and, and gives you all information you, you normally need. So thread topology and so on, and NUMA information. Um, then we need to control the affinity. Um, so um, control where our threads are running on the system. Um, there is, of course, like the OpenMP and MPI environments that you can use. Also, HW log has features in it. NUMA CTL is also known for a NUMA placement. Um, and Liquid contains the Liquid Pin tool, um, which is like a more sophisticated tool and, and gives you a lot of freedom to select which course and where to run. Um, Liquid does not contain a runtime profiling tool like GProf um, or all the other tools. Um, I think there are better tools out there than I can program them. So uh, we reuse them, we reuse them. So I mainly use GProf. Um, or perf, um, yeah, but that's only like to get the, the hot functions out of a program. Um, for performance analysis, of course, there's the big uh, Intel VTune tool for H86 CPUs or Intel CPUs. Um, Parpy-based tools uh, are quite big, so probably most of the tools you will hear in this these talk series will have a Parpy backend or a perf backend directly. Um, liquid perf counter is somewhat uh, is, is similar, but has different access ways. So um, we we also support perf, but there are also other ways to access these registers. Um, in the end, we have micro benchmarking. Most of you know the stream benchmark. Um, LM bench is is quite known. Um, UArch bench. Uh, the the bandwidth benchmark from also for our, from our group uh, we could name there um but if you want to go to real details um you can use liquid bench which is written in mostly assembly so all the benchmarks are written in assembly and therefore we exactly know what the hardware has to execute um to to finish this benchmark and we can derive uh, more detailed values out of that so Liquid stands for like I knew what I'm doing, um, was developed by my colleague Georg Hager, the name. Um, we also, we, we already prepared some YouTube videos now during the, the COVID crisis. Um, it's not really full yet. So we have not all tools covered there, um, but if you wanna check it out, it's like five to 10 minutes short introduction about specific tools. Um, everything in, in Liquid is open source, so all information you can get there, um, can you re reuse that, can, can use it for other things um, as well. Uh, the main repository is at GitHub, so uh, here in the bottom you see the main link. Um, there are also other uh, links out there, so like our um, 
local page, which direct directs uh, then in the end also to the GitHub page. So everything is in the GitHub page. Also, the wiki is quite big on the on, on GitHub. Um, also, issue tracker and everything works uh, over GitHub. We don't have something separate for that. Uh, yeah. So the Liquid Tool Suite is a command line tool suite for for Linux. Um, we try to, to move it to other operating systems, but it's not that easy. Um, on Linux, uh, at least it's easy to install. So basically it's a make, make install thing. Um, it works with a standard Linux kernel. So no kernel patches, kernel modules or anything is, are required. Uh, in most cases, it simply works out of the box. Um, it's simple and clear to use. I mean, the 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 curve the learning curve in the beginning is quite steep um, but uh, as soon as you you get the syntax once um, it's quite easy to to use it every day uh, we support let's say most x86 cpus i would say almost all um, it's maybe some exotic ones uh, like the chinese uh, amd zen copy uh, which we don't support um, but on x86, it's like all since Intel Pentium. So Intel Pentium can still be used with Liquid. Um, we also support ARM, Power, and NVIDIA GPUs. I will have some slides about NVIDIA GPUs in the end. Some tools here, um, Liquid Topology, uh, Liquid Pin, Liquid Perf Counter, Liquid to Power Meter, and Liquid Bench. There are some more, um, but it's basically they do what the name implies. So liquid topology prints the topology. Yeah. Liquid pin pins. Um, perf counter counts perf, so performance. Um, with power meter, you can measure the energy consumption and um, somehow steer it. Um, and with liquid bench, you can do micro benchmarking. So let's look in uh, liquid topology. Um, here's directly the output. I think it's, I, I combined all the slides in a single slide set and that by, with that copy pasting, I killed all the headlines. Uh, I will try to do that better when we publish the PDF somewhere um, that the uh, format is right. So here we see the output of liquid topology on an uh, Intel Haswell EP node. Um, in the beginning, you get some basic information. Um, what's the official brand name? Um, what is a, what chip is inside? So this is already coming from Liquid. So Liquid detects an Intel Haswell EP processor. Um, afterwards, we get a list of the hardware thread topology. So where is the thread located in the system? Um, we see we have two sockets, 14 cores per socket, and we have SMT enabled. So S threads per core are two. Um, and then we have a whole list. So this is the official naming or numbering from the operating system here in the front. And there we see like, which is the thread ID, the core ID on which socket they are and whether they are available in your CPU set. Um, so if you are running in a CPU set, uh, some uh, CPUs or some hardware threads will probably miss this uh, star in the end. So you cannot use them and, and Liquid will try to avoid to use them. Um, then you get a whole list of socket uh, IDs. So, so which uh, hardware threads are on which socket. Um, then follow this by the, the cache topology as a, as a next section. There we see we have three levels of cache um, and the level one and level two cache are shared by the physical core and its SMT thread. So 0 and 28, 1, 29, and so on. And the L3 cache is shared um, by, by seven uh, physical CPUs and their SMT threads. So this means in this case, uh, the cluster on die feature is enabled on, on Intel Haswell, which splits the L3 cache of a, of a socket into two um, equal parts. Uh, then we have the, the NUMA topology. So how many NUMA nodes do we have? Where are they? Uh, where do they reside? What is the distance between those? Um, it's quite similar to the output of NUMA CTL. Um, 
but there you can see like uh, the also the the CPU list again and, and free memory and so on. Um, one of the the only graphic features we have in Liquid is the graphical topology output. Um, it looks like that. You need a quite wide terminal to to see that or reduce the font size. Um, if you're in a recent system, when we started the the output, the maximum were eight uh, hardware threads. So this fitted in most terminals, but with now uh, with, with current systems, um, it's not that easy to to print that in 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 a visible way. Um, so. Uh, I don't really use that output, but it's nice for um, presentations like this to simply copy that and um, already have a, a nice picture of how the hardware looks like. Um, since we know now where the hardware threads are located in the system and how they are distributed on the sockets and so on, uh, we can think about to run our application. Um, to control where the application is running, we can use uh, thread and process affinity. Um, and the liquid tool for that is liquid pin. And there's also a YouTube video for that. Um, here's the motivation why you use that, why you need that. So here we have a sim, we, we ran the stream benchmark on a AMD Naples system. So Zen one um, system. This is the, the triad part of it. And we didn't use any pinning. Um, and you see there's a high variation in performance. Um, and you, you never reach like the, the maximum bandwidth. Uh, so not in the not in the not in the average or mean. Um, only only for a few um, runs we get the, the highest performance. Um, if we do pinning, like we do did it on the right side, that's compact pinning with the physical cores first, first socket first, and then we go over to the other sockets. We see this saturation type of curve here in the bottom until we, we reach the number of nodes in a CMG uh, or in a, in a, what is it called by at AMD? Compute complex, something like that. Um, and afterwards we have uh, linear scaling. That's a common picture if you do compact pinning um, and, and uh, working on a shared resource. Um, this graph also contains the min-max uh, whiskers, and you see there's almost no variation in performance. Um, it's quite pinpointed, um, and that's why we do we, we should control the affinity because it gives us um, opportunities to make use of architectural features um, and eliminate the performance variation. So that we what we've seen here. The architectural features here in that case would be to um, reuse like caches and uh, and uh, fully use all memory links, uh, memory bandwidth um, that we have. Uh, we also avoid resource contention. So if you schedule two threads on the same physical core, um, they compete about the uh, L1 cache and L2 cache and so on. Um, because it's a shared resource among them. So we don't want that, so we, we should control the affinity. Um, here's a short like outlook why this compact pinning causes this funny behavior. So this uh, saturation curve for the first part and then the linear scaling. Um, so this is the normal saturation curve as we uh, would like to see it. Um, so that we, we hit the, the top, uh, the, the maximum utilization of the shared resource um, quite early with, with a lower number of cores. Um, and then we have this uh, straight line because we cannot uh, achieve more than that. Um, the reason for this picture is simply that on this part, um, so since the, the implicit barrier at the end of uh, opening the open MP um, parallel, um, regions, um, the, the first threads utilize the, the memory bandwidth to the fullest. So they, um, they cannot run faster than that. That's basically this point um, where we have the full um, 
contention or the full operation of the, of the single memory link. And as soon as we, we add another thread, um, it can use more, um, it is alone on the socket and can use the full memory bandwidth for its own um, operation. And then they, it, it has to wait in the barrier in the end. So, um, and we see this uh, always if you, if you do this uh, kind of pinning. Um, so the, the, the speeders um, are waiting here, exactly that's this point. Um, yeah, that was just a short outlook. Um, for process affinity, uh, there are many different options to use. Um, so there are these highly OS dependent system calls um, like set, uh, set affinity. This is also available on Windows. It is not available on OS X. Um, so OS X does not allow you to pin threads to specific cores. You can just pin it to a specific cache. Um, but since the cache is shared, it's not they they can jump around on the cores attached to the thread to the cache. Then we have the HW lock project, uh, which has quite sophisticated pinning functionality, um, but it's always um, up to you. So you have to do it in your application yourself. Um, there's like semi-automatic pinning um, by most OpenMP runtimes, um, but also like the generic Linux tools task set and NUMA CTL, um, which is, not real pinning, it's more a control of the CPU set. Um, OpenMP4 has these OMP places uh, thing you can use. Um, but for me, I, I, it's quite complicated. So I, I don't like this way of uh, specifying it. Um, then the Slurm batch scheduler, which is in use on most uh, systems nowadays, um, also has some pinning functionalities uh, built in, and also the MPI libraries um, have some functionality for that. So what is what is the difference with liquid pin? So um, similar to task set and, and NUMA CTL, we, we pin the threads and processes from the outside. We don't touch the code. We, you don't need to change anything in the code. Um, it has support for P threads um, and the different OpenMP runtimes. Um, also, like Silk Plus and so on, are, are tested um, and work quite well. I'm I'm trying to check the chat. Oh, no questions. Okay. Um, it's since it's a combination of a wrapper tool with an uh, LD preload library. Um, the binary must be dynamically linked. That's the only. Uh, thing that that is required for liquid pin to do its its work all the other stuff is like um, out of bound of the application um, it has different ways of specifying uh, cpus and hardware threads where to run the application um, the the easiest way if you learn how to use it um, is the uh, logic core numbering inside a node or an affinity domain. I will come to that um, in, in a few minutes, seconds. Um, the simplest usage is probably by selecting the physical um, core IDs or um, as, as the operating system um, uh, numbered them. So here we have this example, liquid pin, and then we run on the cores zero to th three, four, and six. And we just run our application and liquid pin is doing its magic um, so that the application and, and all the application threads run only on the, these cores. Um, the user is always right. Um, that's, that's like the main philosophy of liquid. So if the user specifies something that overrides liquid settings, um, it, it is always, um, accepted and respected. So if you set OMP num threads four, but have like more uh, cores in the uh, CPU set, um, this OMP num threads four is like directly handed over to the application. So no changes, no manipulation of that um, by liquid pin. Um, if you don't specify OMP num threads, liquid pin will set OMP num threads to the number of 
threads equal to the number of cores in the selected list. Um, so now we come to the, the logical core numbering, which is like a nice feature and I, I, I love it and I use it like daily. Um, is the logical numbering inside from thread of thread groups. So here in the bottom, we see two examples of that. Um, the first one pins on the first physical cores of socket zero, uh, for, for, uh, first eight physical cores of socket zero. So S0 specifies socket zero. If you have more sockets, there's also S1 and so on. Um, C1 specifies the last level cache, so the L3 cache. And we always, um, with the logical numbering, we request physical core IDs, uh, physical cores, and skip SMT threads. So if, if your system runs with SMT, um, those are skipped here um, to get the full potential of the node first, and then we fill up the SMT nodes. Um, so what the thread groups are is basically um, threads that belong to a same topological entity, um, like a socket and so on. Um, the a thread domain is always named by a single character and its index um, in the system. Um, as, as on the last slide here, we see there's uh, like, uh, we want socket one and the first four physical cores. Um, if, if it would be socket zero, it would look like that. So it would take, skip, would skip the SMT thread and would take zero, one, two, three. Um, since the numbering here is like equal to those numbers, it's not that interesting. But if, if you think that it, the, core, uh, the socket starts with like core 20, so we have 20, 21, 22, 23, it will still the same um, notation and liquid will select the, the proper um, threads out of socket one. You can chain them. So here, if you want to have the four physical cores on both sockets, socket zero and one can combine that with an edge. Um, just as a remark, if there are any questions, just feel free to speak up or write it in the chat. I will check the chat from, from time to time. At the moment, we define four to five um, different thread domains. So always present is the node domain, which contains all uh, threads in the node, so all hardware threads in the node. If you don't specify any minus C with liquid pin, it always takes the full node. Um, so pins the threads to the, the uh, to the whole node consecutively. Um, yeah. Uh, with S, you, you specify the socket. With M, you get memory domain or NUMA domain. <coughs> Sorry. And with C, we have the outer level cache. So in most systems, it's level three cache, um, but we have also like level two uh, systems. Uh, so systems with only two cache levels like uh, A64FX and so on. And there is then the L2 cache. Um, the latest versions also has a D domain for the CPU die, um, which was uh, introduced um, with um, by these uh, gluing together of multiple chips to one uh, to one uh, package. Um, that's, for example, done for uh, Intel Cascade Lake AP, um, and also the A64FX has a single socket but four dies in the socket. So we have a, a new domains here, um, but uses the same like before. Um, if you have a system with a lot of uh, hardware threads, um, the, the expression syntax is, is quite handy. Um, it's like a function where we uh, tell, give us like 120 threads, take two out of four. So it will take two threads, then jump over two, take again two, and so on. Um, and we have also like these special um, domains like scatters. Um, so we, we can tell M column scatter, which scatters the threads over all NUMA domains. Um, here we have an example again. This is not using um, physical cores first. So it's using the, the original sorting of the hardware threads. Um, so if we have uh, only this setting, 
We take the first four threads, independent where they are, whether they are SMT threads or not, Liquid does not care. Um, in the second case, we tell it take one out of two, so it will jump over the SMT thread and will like, take two, uh, two, uh, zero, two, four, and six. Um, if you have a really big systems, um, we had that, for example, with the Xeon Phi and also like the latest AMD nodes, um, they have a, quite a lot of uh, CPUs. And this is, for example, the, the shortest way to specify like 120 threads with two per. Uh, so this was uh, SMT4 on the Xeon Phi. So we had two th uh, threads per physical core. Um, so yeah, this was like all theoretical. How does it look like when we run it? Um, so here we run the, the simple stream benchmark. Um, and it, as soon as the, the application tries to start up uh, threads, uh, the, the pthread wrapper kicks in um, and it tells us what it does. Um, so it pins the main application to the core zero because that's like this one, the, the first one in the set and the other ones. So the threads will be pinned to one, two and three. Like we, we have it here. Um, and then we see it here are the four, uh, three threads that are additionally started to the main application thread and they are all pinned to the um, specified course. So there we get a direct feedback of where our application runs. Um, we can turn that off with, a, with the quiet flag um, if we don't want that output in our, in our log files or something like that. Um, so although we, we care about node level performance engineering, um, I'm pretty aware that MPI is like the, the common interface to use uh, or common kind of environment to use to run HPC applications. Um, so there's also a, a wrapper for that. It's called liquid MPI run. Um, and it's basically a wrapper for liquid pin, um, but made MPI aware. So um, it is especially, especially uh, usable for hybrid um, applications. So for MPI plus X, uh, MPI plus OpenMP or MPI plus pre-threads or whatever. Um, so here is a pure MPI example. So we, we tell liquid MPI run to run on 16 um, processes and we wanna have two processes per socket. Um, and liquid MPI run will automatically uh, request four nodes for that because like 16 processes, two per socket, um, or it, it depends how many sockets your system has, but on a, uh, on a single socket system, it would request like four, um, four nodes and, and run the application and pin the application using liquid pin under the hood um, to, to exactly um, run two on a socket. If we wanna have like hybrid pinning, there are different ways to specify it. Um, if we wanna have like, uh, this is the same one as above. So we have two sockets in, in this case, and we wanna have like two um, processes, one running on the core zero one on socket one, uh, socket zero, and the other one on the first two of socket one. And we also wanna have 16 um, processes. So in this case, it, it will run, uh, it will also request four nodes um, because like it's two MPI processes, um, but four open MP threads inside these two MPI processes. Um, there's a short way to, man to do that. Um, simply with minus T, you can set, set specify how many threads your application should use. So four MPI processes, two per each having two open MP threads. And then Liquid will try to figure out the topology of the, of the nodes and um, pin, the feed, pin that stuff. Um, yeah. So here's an example for, a, uh, for two nodes. Um, we wanna have four processes and two processes should run per node. Um, each on the first four, uh, first six CPUs of a socket. 
So we will fill the, the first socket uh, of node zero will be filled with the first six process, uh, open MP threads by MPI task zero and so on. So we fill it up. Um, if you use like an Intel MPI way to specify it, it would look like that. Um, so a little bit longer, um, but also quite still, still handy um, to use. Um, yeah, the liquid MPI run is like, I don't run that many MPI applications. Um, I'm, I'm doing mostly research on a node level. So um, it's not that uh, maintained as the other tools, like tell it like that. And um, the environment of your HPC center is, uh, might uh, break it. Um, so we had that case in our center as well, like a week ago, we updated Slurm and Slurm now does something else and this kills liquid MPI run. Um, I fixed that, um, but it's like always, I'm one step behind the MPI and um, batch scheduler developers. Um, more important, if you wanna do research on a node, is to control the clock speed. Um, this is commonly only allowed for uh, administrators or root users. Um, with Liquid, you could also do that as a user. Um, for that, we have uh, Liquid Power Meter and Liquid Set Frequencies. So with Liquid Power Meter, um, you can get like what is the base clock and minimal clock that is a supported by your system and what is the turbo mode steps. So if you wanna run with a single core, we can go up to 3.3 uh, gigahertz on that node, on that, AM, on that Haswell node. Um, if we run all 14 cores, we get only this 2.8 gigahertz as maximum turbo. Um, we can measure the, um, the power energy consumption um, with liquid power meter, but only in a very simplistic case um, with liquid perf counter, which will come later. We can um, specify regions in our code to, um, to measure and so on. Um, the, the more important to, to set the frequency is the set frequency tool, which is basically the, the tool which does the work in the end. Liquid power meter just prints out the information um, if you have turbo mode enabled, reliable benchmarking is quite hard because the system can decide to go in turbo or not. Um, it is the, the all, of, all these frequency settings are just hints to the system. Um, so the system is free to override them, um, but uh, normally it, it tries to respect it. Um, if you manipulate the CPU frequency, you can save a lot of energy, um, of course, sacrificing the, um, uh, the performance mostly, um, but there are cases where you can reduce the um, CPU frequency without losing any uh, performance. So uh, how we set it, uh, liquid set frequency is the command line tool for that. With minus L, you could get the available frequencies. Um, it's dependent on the, on the kernel driver. Um, one gives out all the spins, like 1.7 gigahertz, 1.8 gigahertz, and so on. The other one gives you a free range. So it tells you like all frequencies between 1.2 and 2.3 gigahertz are usable. And you can simply specify them. Um, with minus P, you get print out which cores are currently, uh, how the cores are currently running, at which frequency. Um, this 0 0.1 is always the, the sign that it runs in turbo frequency. Um, so the, there's the one kernel driver, which does not have the notion of like turbo frequencies. Um, it uses 2.3 as the base frequency and then 2.301 as the turbo frequency, independent what it is, whether it's 2.8 or whatever. Um, so this one is running in turbo mode. Um, we can fix the frequency to 2.0 gigahertz um, simply by setting 
liquid set frequency minus f 2.0, then frequency is pinned on our cores to 2.0. You can specify with minus c, you can specify the cores you wanna have. Uh, so you wanna, wanna change it um, using the same syntax as liquid pin. Um, so you can change it for a single uh, core if you want, and if that makes any sense. Um, to disable turbo, we have a turbo mode flag, um, and it really sets the flips the bit in the hardware register. So it's not like telling the operating system, please turn off the turbo. It's, it's, it's really doing it on, on hardware level. Um, the, the latest uh, frequency development uh, was the so-called Encore frequency. Um, it's differently named at AMD. Um, they have like GMI frequency and, and some, some others, um, but it's like the same um, idea behind it. So it, since we have SOCs uh, system on chips, um, they contain not only the compute cores, but also like environmental um, units like memory controllers and so on. And they have an own clock domain. Um, the L3 cache is also part of it in, uh, for Intel CPUs. Um, and you can manipulate the frequency of those parts. So um, if you do a liquid set frequency minus P, you get in the end this encore frequency section and um, it, you can manipulate it there. Um, it has a considerable impact on power consumption. See, you see some pictures. They are also like on 7th of September, there will be a energy efficient workshop where they added that to this EAR framework, which we can manipulate that on the fly under the hood. Um, we once um, made uh, rank one by the LINPAC challenge on the student computing challenge at the uh, SC conference by reducing the anchor frequency um, and, and thus uh, saving, saving um, energy, which we use to, to overclock the CPU cores. So in the end, we get the highest LINPAC rate with that um, and won the, uh, won, won the whole competition. So it is, um, it is helpful um, and you can do a lot of that, not a lot with that and, and get a, a huge energy um, reduction. So now the, the most important part or the uh, most sophisticated part of liquid is the liquid perf counter. It's the tool for hardware performance monitoring uh, on CPUs and NVIDIA GPUs. Um, so yeah, sorry for the format clash here. Um, so the, in most cases, it's, it's convenient to, to have just a, a broad overview um, how the application before, uh, performs, um, added, like running the, the application in some high, highly sophisticated tool like VTune um, is often overkill. So you just need some basic values. Like I wanna have the memory bandwidth of that application, yeah? Um, and then you, if you, you can do that with VTune and then uh, click through the um, interfaces to search for it, um, or you use like uh, simple command line tools like liquid uh, perf counter or, or perf uh, and so on. Um, liquid perf counter provides four different measurement modes. Um, the, the first one is the wrapper mode, which is like start the uh, counters run the application, stop and evaluate the counter. So it uh, uses the whole application runtime as a measurement. Um, then we have the stethoscope, which is like look from the outside. Um, like you run an application on a compute node and then you SSH to the compute node and want to look how the application behaves. Um, that, that's like stethoscope mode, it's like monitoring. Um, we have the timeline mode, which is like time based sampling. Um, and the, in my um, view, the most important part is the marker API, where we can where we can tell uh, Liquid to measure just fractions of our application. So we can mark regions in our code, like the the hot loops, um, and measure only those. 
Um, working with hardware performance counters is quite annoying because they change between architectures, have different names. Um, sometimes they count a specific feature, sometimes not. Um, so it's, it's difficult. Um, and since the, the user shouldn't have the burden to do that, uh, we provide so-called performance groups. Um, the performance groups is basically a, a set of events, some derived metrics and documentation. Um, and you can get this with liquid curve counter minus A, you get the list of all groups that are available on the current architecture. So if you run it on a Haswell node, you probably get different groups than if you run it on an AMD Zen node or something like that. Um, here are some examples. The green ones are probably the most exam uh, exciting ones. So clock to get the clock frequency to see how, how it behaves. Um, modern systems can even go below their base frequency if you run uh, instructions that require a lot of energy, like AVX512 instructions on, on Intel systems might clock down the CPU. Um, and you can check that with this clock group. Um, then flops DP, flops SP is quite self-explained um, for all users in HPC. So floating points, operations, um, and mem for the memory traffic um, between the sockets and the memory controllers. There are also others like L2, L3, and so on. But um, just uh, to note it again, this, these groups are dependent on the system you are running on. So for example, this was not done on an Intel Haswell system because Intel Haswell has no flops events. Um, they were deactivated by Intel. So you don't have these flops groups there. Here we have some example. Um, you, we tell liquid perf counter to measure like here in that case, the L2 group. So L1, L2 bandwidth uh, uh, traffic. Um, we want it on the first four physical cores of socket one. Um, and then you get these, the small header again from, from liquid, um, just to tell you which architecture you're running on, then the application output. And in the end, you get these kind of tables. Um, these, these events are all specified in this L2 group. And um, based on the events, these metrics are derived. So the load bandwidth, evict bandwidth, and, and data volumes, and so on. Um, it uses the same syntax as liquid pin. So here we want the four physical cores on socket one. And liquid evaluates that on this node, this will be cores 14, 15, 16, and 17. So you don't have to care about the actual IDs here. Um, just specify like how many I want on which in which affinity domain and liquid um, grabs them and, and, and uses them. These events are so-called fixed counters. Um, they are always present on Intel architectures since Intel Core 2. Um, all these three events are always provided. Um, Liquid will automatically add them if you don't have them in your event set. Um, and then we get the counts for each of the groups. So here we have um, the, the configured uh, events. So L1D replacement, um, some L2 trans, and some iCache misses. misses. Um, they, the names are not that easy to, to understand if you, if you don't have the, the information how the hardware looks like. Um, that's why users are mostly interested in these derived metrics. And there we get like the runtime, the runtime unhalted, which is quite an Intel feature. Um, then the, the, the clock frequency, there we can see that it, it runs overclocked. So the, the best frequency is 2.3 gigahertz, but it runs with 2.6 um, on each core. So it is able to overclock a little bit, um, CPI or IPC, um, and then the bandwidth and the, the data volume for the L1 and L2 traffic. Um, wait, yeah. Um, so here's an example about the stethoscope mode. Um, as I said, it's like looking from the outside what is currently happening. Um, it does not cause any overhead to the application. 
Um, of course, our application runs shortly and programs the counters, but afterwards it, it does nothing and simply waits and, and does not consume any um, cycles uh, until we, we hit this uh, 10 seconds. Wait, what's happening here? Yeah. Um, so we measure for 10 seconds here. Um, we can also use MS uh, for milliseconds here. Um, yeah, it's, it's like a monitoring tool. I'm not using that very often, um, but I'm using it if some users on our systems tell me to, to look at their job, um, then I'm logging into the compute node and running um, simple checks with the stethoscope mode um, to see how the user application behaves. Um, one example where we use it is we derive the empirical roof line model from all of our cluster nodes uh, or cluster jobs. So these are um, all the nodes in, in the Maggie cluster and um, where their current um, execution point is, say like that. Um, we have that in our monitoring interface. So the users can also see that for their jobs um, where they are located in the, in the roof line model. Um, the, the most important part um, for me, at least, um, is the marker API because normally we don't want to have like a, a view of the whole application, which contains like the init phase and, and the printout in the end and so on. That, that's not what we are interested in. We are interested in the hot loops. Um, and that's why we want to restrict our measurements um, to specific regions. And we can do that with the marker API. Um, so you can have multiple of those regions. Um, you can, you can um, overlap them. Um, you can nest them, um, whatever you want to do. Um, every time this start-stop region is passed, um, the results are accumulated. So you get in the end the, the result for, the, for all runs of the, of the region. Um, to add it to an application, so here's the C API. There's also other APIs. Um, you include the liquid marker header, and then we have some macros. Um, liquid marker init and liquid marker close should be called somewhere in the serial region. So something like in the beginning and the end of the main routine. Um, and then we can use start stop around the um, regions of interest. Um, these should be called by each thread of our application. So because each thread is measuring for itself. Um, each group can have a distinct name. Um, this will be printed out in the end at the, uh, the evaluation. Um, we can see like this is the, the results for the compute region and this is the result for the post-processing region. Um, these, since I've said these are macros, so in order to activate the macros, we have to specify minus D liquid perfmon. Um, otherwise, these calls are simply empty and don't cause any overhead. Um, so it's quite handy. You add the markers once and you can uh, disable and enable them at compile time with this um, flag. In order to run it, um, we also use the liquid perf counter tool similar like before, but we add the minus M switch to tell liquid that markers are involved. Um, there is also a Fortran 90 um, API, which is quite similar to that. Um, there's a, Port a Python API, there's a Julia API, and there's a, I think, Lua API. Um, so if you need any other operating system, uh, other programming language, um, it might be there. Um, if not, um, just let, leave me a note and I can check that out. Um, as I said, to compile it, um, of course, we need the, the include path where liquid resides and we have this dliquid perfmon. <coughs> Sorry. Um, for linking, we need the library path and we link with the library, uh, liquid library. To run it, as I said, simply liquid perf counter minus C. Um, capital C is important here. Um, capital C means use these cores here 
and pin to these cores. So measure on the cores and pin to those cores. If you use a, a, a minus C, it means only measure on those cores. Um, I don't care where the application is running. So the application is responsible to run on the selected cores. So always use a capital C here, then minus G with the group or the event set and minus M for the markers. In the end, you get one separate block of output for each mark region. Um, but be aware, um, it's code that is executed inside your application. So it's causing overhead. Um, these counter reads are quite expensive. So don't call it um, too frequently. Um, what to look at? Um, we are mainly working, uh, we are only looking at resource utilization, less like uh, these uh, more abstract things like cache missions and so on. We want to really know how much data is, is transferred. I mean, a cache miss can also uh, not cause any um, data uh, movement, uh, but might be. Um, the other one is instruction decomposition. So what is really happening in the core? <clears throat> Things to, to measure if, you, if you're working on your application are the uh, operational throughput, of course, the, the flops, so the actual work which we are doing. Um, the overall instruction throughput, the CPI, um, it might, or IPC, it's also um, like the inverse. Um, it might be misleading. I have some, some slides for that, um, but it is uh, quite interesting metric to look at in the, in the first view. Um, for instruction breakdown, um, we want to have like the number of floating point instructions, load and store instructions, spans, branch instructions, and so on. And then we can um, split it up and see how, how, how large of the fraction uh, of instructions is that we execute. So if we have an ap application which executes only 1% of floating point operations, you will probably never hit like peak flop rate. Yeah, simply like that. Um, Instruction breakdown to SIMD width, um, like Scala, SSE, and so on, is uh, possible on Intel systems. On other systems, it's it's not that easy. You, sometimes you do, don't get the the SIMD width out of the hardware counters, um, but it's always a, a interesting view to see if you told the compiler to use like AVX five twelve. Did it really use it, or is it falling back to AVX because of heuristics? Um, data volume from bandwidth, that's like the resource utilization um, to main memory and the different cache levels. Um, so that, for that, we have the memory L2 and L3 groups and so on, and like the clock frequency and the power. Um, I think caused by the, yeah. So these are the, the performance groups, uh, MemDP, MemSP, um, which is a combination of memory and flops DP and flops SP. Um, so it measures everything in a single run, um, quite handy. Um, branch for branch prediction stuff, data for load st store ratios and, and so on, um, and L2 and L3. So that are these, uh, the main groups we, we use on a daily basis. Um, uh, here's an example how to, to add the markers to your application. Um, so it's a triangular matrix vector multiplication, uh, quite simple. Um, we execute it for multiple rounds. So here we have a round loop so that we have some kind of steady state um, inside our benchmark. And this is like a naive implementation of uh, matrix vector multiplication uh, in C. This is a, um, a guard for that the compiler cannot optimize away the loop because we, we don't use these values in CBAC after the loop. So the compiler might optimize it away. To avoid that, we have to add like a guard like that. So in order to add the marker API, um, as I said, we include the marker header, now the liquid header, um, and then we have liquid marker in it and liquid marker close somewhere in the serial region. So outside of the parallel. Um, and then we have inside the parallel region executed by each thread, 
we have this liquid marker start and the stop around the loop of interest. And we named the region compute. So uh, we could also use a different name. Um, and if we run it, so on th three cores, so zero, one, and two, we want to have like the L2, uh, L1, L2 memory, uh, L1, L2 bandwidth and data volume with markers. And then you see you have here, the first is the name you, you get printed out. That's the string we specified in the, um, in the program. We see that the, the, uh, the region is traversed 10 times. So it's 10 times called. Um, this is the runtime for each thread in the region. Um, and here we have again, our results, uh, same metrics as uh, events that we have seen before. And interesting is this part. So the, the instructions retired, um, they, they rise. So core zero does the, the least amount of um, instructions and core two does most of them. Um, why it is like that? Um, the retired instructions um, are misleading on Intel CPUs and or on all x86 CPUs. Um, because this OpenMP barrier waiting in the end of OpenMP parallel um, executes many instructions. It's basically a hot loop. Um, and this is issuing a lot of NOAB instructions, which are all counted as retired. Um, and that's why you get pictures like that. So that the last thread is always doing most of the work, uh, most of the instruction work. Let's take it like that. Um, if we measure actual work, so flops, um, we see that the first one is doing most of them and the last one is doing the least of them. Um, this is on an uh, Intel Sandy Bridge system. The, the counters, the floating point counters for Sandy Bridge are only qualitatively correct. So it's, it's not the actual number that is interesting, but it's more like the, the way how it behaves. Um, and this is simply called by the static distribution of the of the matrix. So if we go, uh, miss adding the picture again. So if we split it up like this, in 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 rows, you see that the last one is always getting just this tiny fraction here, while the first one has the big chunk. Um, and this is caused uh, this causes this behavior. Um, if we change like the OMP schedule to, to static with a chunk size of 16, so the, the, the blocks for each thread are getting smaller, um, we, we can almost um, remove the imbalance. Um, there we see that the, the flops are equally distributed among the threads, not perfectly, but, but quite well. Um, and we also get some uh, performance improvement um, because we are not waiting in barrier that, that much. Um, but, but have like a saturation curve like that. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so summary of hardware performance monitoring, um, you, you should know what you look for. Um, you, you, you can create a huge amount of data with hardware performance monitoring. Um, so, uh, think about first what you want from it and then run exactly that. Um, in our opinion, the resource-based metrics are the most useful ones. Um, so transfers, so data transfers, work executed and so on. Um, these instructions, CPI, cache misses and whatever um, can be misleading. Um, so just to, to keep in mind for that. Um, always think about that the processor work is, is not equal to the user work. Uh, so the waiting times in the, in the barriers is one example. The other one is like um, non uh, if you have a store miss in the L1, you have an implicit load under the hood, um, which is like not seen by the, by the application and it's also not visible in assembly. So it's, it, the processor has to do some management under the hood um, which can be measured with hardware performance monitoring, but there is no direct relation to the application itself. Um, for what we use it as a, at all, uh, um, also is to validate performance models. So we try to derive performance models um, 
how the application runs and what is like the light speed model for that. And then we, we try to validate that with hardware performance monitoring. Um, this is the, the fourth part, it's quite short um, and it's about the NVIDIA GPU functionality, which I added in Liquid uh, 5.0. Um, it's always, so we are already at the moment at 5.2.0. So um, two uh, major versions back. Um, but in the beginning, there was only this compute capability until seven. Um, so internally, Liquid uses two different interfaces from NVIDIA um, and it selects it on the fly. So depending on the GPUs you have in your system and the available uh, libraries and so on, it selects which one is, is usable on your system. Um, similar as we have seen it to the CPU topology in the beginning, um, if you have GPUs in your system, it will add a separate section with GPU topology. Um, so here, this is some example output. Uh, it's a system with four GPUs and there you get um, the basic information um, for the GPU. Um, all the others would, would follow, of course, the other three. Um, yeah. Um, hardware performance monitoring is quite similar to, to the CPU part. Um, so to get the event lists, we will run liquid perf counter minus E. This is quite long. So um, paste it to, uh, so pipe it to less or more or whatever. Um, and it's printing out the events for each CPU, uh, each GPU. So if you have four GPUs, you get four times uh, lists. Uh, so quite long. Um, the performance groups are also listed with liquid perf counter minus A. There's simply a separate section where you have like GPU um, performance groups and CPU performance groups. <coughs> and it just uses sim uh, different switches on the command line. So minus G to select the GPUs, minus uh, capital V for selecting the group. Um, and it's currently only using um, the marker API because we need to be inside the applications. Um, just a second. Um, Back in a second, moment. So, um, so the, the NVIDIA libraries um, require that the performance measuring part is inside the application. Um, and the only way to achieve that is to use the market API. So at the moment, only the market API is supported. It's a different market API. Um, and um, it's, it's different because if you wanna overlap CPU and GPU regions, um, it would be uh, difficult to do that with a single um, marker API. So now we can specify the part for the CPU and the part for the GPU and um, get separate measurements for that. Um, we are looking at a, a short example. So this is a 2D double position Jacobi stencil in, in Fortran. Um, it's quite simple. It's, it's uh, summing up the values, the four surrounding values um, multiplying it with some constant and then writing it out in a, in a different lattice. Um, so this is called a lattice side update. Um, that's the metric we use for stencil operations. So one of those operations is one lattice side update. Um, and the performance metric is then lattice side updates per second. Um, to get to the flops rate, we multiply it by four simply. So how to use the 
liquid NV marker API, so NVIDIA marker API um, in, in Fortran in this example. Um, the, the RPs are quite similar. Um, so here's the, the CPU part liquid marker in it. Um, that's the, if you don't use the macros, but the, the original function names, it's like that. And the NVIDIA marker API function, the same thing as liquid NV marker in it. So most function calls are just like, have this NV prefix in it, that's all. Um, as before, we call liquid marker in it and liquid marker close somewhere in the beginning and the end. Um, we could register a region. Um, this would like set up the basic data structures. This is optional. We could also do that on the CPU. There's also a, a marker register region for CPUs. For CPUs, it might have a bigger impact because it already, it reduces the overhead at the first start, um, but it's, it's a pure optional call. And then we surround the region of interest with start and stop markers. Um, here, uh, we name it Jacobi. Similar to the CPU part, we add a liquid underscore nvmon uh, flag to the compilation. Um, the CUDA libraries need to be in the LD library path, so need to be available at runtime. Um, and the RP is available for um, C, C++, Fortran, and Python. Um, probably also Lua, Julia, I'm not sure at the moment. Um, because the Julia interface is developed by the Julia labs at MIT themselves, and I'm not involved in the development there. Um, a common use cases to optimize the thread block size. If you have a new GPU, um, you have to determine what's the perfect block size for your application. Um, the, it is uh, crucial to get performance out of your system of, of the GPU um, to, to not overlap the cache lines between threads um, because that causes performance degradation. And that's why this one is probably not beneficial. Um, this one as well, um, but this one seems quite good. Um, we tried two different cases um, and, and measure the, the L2 traffic with that. So one is this um, setting. So one block, 256 and, and one, um, and 60, uh, 40, 64 blocks uh, per two. Um, this is just setting if, if you are interested in how we run that. Um, so matrix is big enough to not fit in any uh, GPU cache. And here we see the results. So for the first example, we reach about 14 gigalops per second, or times four if you wanna have the flop rate. Um, and we see that the global, uh, the data volume between L1 and L2 cache is 433 uh, gigabytes. If we use a different block setting, we get a higher um, performance out of it um, by reduce, by directly reducing the data volume used between L1 and L2 cache traffic. Yeah, so this is a, just a simple example. Um, a roadmap um, for the accelerator support. There are some corner cases for NVIDIA GPUs, which are not addressed well at the moment. Um, so if you have an application which starts another application and both use NVIDIA GPUs, this is currently not supported because it changes the context under the hood. Um, the energy monitoring and setting manipulation through NVML is currently in the making and almost done. Um, interfaces for AMG, AMD GPUs is also almost done, almost done. is done by the uh, TU Munich and the University of Stuttgart. Um, and they also do the NVML part of the AMD GPUs. So also energy monitoring and so on. Um, Intel GPUs is an early stage. So the topology part works already, but the monitoring part works not. Um, the, I'm doing this, so and I'm quite busy, so it's uh, I'm I'm still having it on my to-do list. Um, as a summary, um, it's a whole suite of command line tools, following partly the Unix philosophy. So one tool for a, a simple tool for a single task. 
Um, it's easy to use tools for a daily work. So I use them daily at least and on my group as well. Um, it supports all relevant CPU architectures. Um, if new architectures come out, we commonly have uh, access to machines like that before release um, so that Liquid can provide the support at the release date. So that's that's normally my, my goal to achieve. Um, NVIDIA GPUs are supported, others are coming. Um, as I said, the main target is node level performance engineering. Um, if you wanna try it out, see it on, on GitHub, um, check also the, the Wiki page there. Um, if you wanna have contact with me, there's a liquid group at the Matrix chat service. Um, there's also a development chat, um, but yeah. And, and I think my, my email address is also like easy to remember if you know my name. Um, so uh, just let me know if you have some questions. And that's it from my side.